So hello, good evening. Okay. Uh, I would like to welcome you all in this event tonight here at uh, the Europe House in London. My name is Michael Arapis and I am the Honorary Treasurer of the New Europeans Association Limited and uh, the Wales Coordinator for the New Europeans. This event is co-hosted by the New Europeans and the Hellenic Medical Society and is about the rights of EU citizens in the UK and how Brexit will impact our lives. The event is live streamed as well and the video will be posted online afterwards so everyone will be able to see it and use the information provided. Uh, we will have a short address from the panelists and then the presentation from the immigration solicitor Zahira Patel, an associate at the law firm Fragomen. You will be able to ask questions at the end of the presentation. The presentation will be in English, but if there are any questions that you may have and you uh, perhaps uh, feel uh, uh, more comfortable to ask them in Greek, uh, please do so and I will interpret. Okay. So, uh, the New Europeans is a wonderful organization uh, who is fighting for the rights of EU citizens in the UK and the uh, UK citizens in the EU. And I'm very proud to be a member and I will encourage you all actually to join and support us. I'm a volunteer and I work for this organization simply in order to safeguard our rights. More about the New Europeans later. So now, okay. I would like to thank very much for their hard work, Tamara Flanagan OBE, the lady here, uh, and Roger Casali, the CEO of the New Europeans, and of course, uh, Tamsin Kumis, uh, who worked very hard very hard for the organization of uh, this event. Thank you. So, uh, I would also like to thank the Hellenic Medical Society for their support and especially uh, the president, uh, Dr. Miltos uh, Krokidis. So, at the end of the Q&A session after the presentation, uh, please stay and join us uh, for uh, some snacks and refreshments at the back of the room there. On, and uh, the building closes at nine, uh, so we have to leave by that time. So at uh, this, uh, it gives me great pleasure then at this moment to call uh, uh, Tamara Flanagan OBE, uh, who will explain more about our work and our campaigns. She's the project manager of the New Europeans. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about New Europeans. It was started in 2012 uh, by Roger Casale. Um, and originally its idea was to remind European citizens living in the UK particularly but they had other rights than working and studying, that they could stand for parliament, that they could vote in elections, that they could be active in their communities, they could be a crime commissioner if they wanted to be, but that there was a, war, a broader role around European citizenship than was necessarily being brought to their attention. So we did quite a lot of work in the first couple of years, encouraging EU citizens to make their voices heard in their local communities. And in our numbers, we have some people who are councillors, who are mayors formerly, who have been pretty active in their communities. This theme of making your voice heard became very important in 2015. And this, you all remember, is the year before the Brexit. And in fact, a negative discourse grew up in the UK, not so much for Greek citizens, but for other kind of Eastern European citizens, we saw negative uh, television reports, newspapers, people are taking our jobs, taking our homes, taking our schools, taking our benefits. I always struggle with taking benefits and jobs, but there we are. These negative discourse don't always make sense, do they? So we were working a lot at that time to say uh, it's time that people understood who Europeans are, the huge contribution they're making in this country, and the talents and strengths they bring. And it was just as well we started down that road because along came Brexit in 2016 and we've spent a lot of time since then doing really a lot of work around leaving the EU, which is rather unfortunate because it wasn't our original mission, but it's what's needed at this time. Roger in particular does a lot of work at a European level. He works with the European Parliament. There's a friendship group who have been particularly looking at safeguarding Europeans in the UK and British Europeans elsewhere, their rights. He's been working on a green card campaign, which is about every European citizen having a form of identity that they're European. 
irrespective of what their national immigration uh, authorities are saying. And here in the UK, we've been doing rather more practical work. We've been working with the Home Office, who are, have designed now the Settled Status Scheme, which is actually open for people to apply at this time, albeit it's uh, still a kind of practice and it will open formally on the, well, Sahira will tell you, I think, 29th of March. Um, and in support of people understanding about settled status, we have also worked with the GLA. We have someone seconded to the mayor's office, and as a result of that work, you will see it's on our website, but there are some leaflets here. There is a hub now on the Mayor of London's website. It's in 27 languages and it tells you where you can find information about settled status and where you can get immigration advice. At this stage, it's quite young, so it will need to be developed a bit more, but it is there. One of the things that New Europeans does is to produce languages in uh, leaflets, rather, in own language. This one happens to be Bulgarian, I think. We don't have a Greek one, we haven't got round to that. But it's not because we don't think people speak good English. It's because we think when you're talking about your immigration status, you want to be absolutely certain about the terminology. And I'm sure the hero would say that there isn't a very good translation for second status even yet. So that's been an important part of our work. The mayor's office, the work that's going on there, you will have noticed the London is open campaign. If you watched the fireworks on New Year's Eve, it was the 27 languages saying London is open which caused a bit of a furore in some quarters, but the mayor is very stalwart in making Europeans feel this is your home and you don't need to go anywhere, but you do need to apply for settled status. And that's the important message of all of the sessions that we do, where we're aided and abetted by very uh, well-informed and expert lawyers, that it won't go away. Even if you've been here 30 years, even if you've got a flippy green bit of paper that you got when you came, everybody, with a few exceptions, has to apply for settled status. And I think it's fair to say, whatever happens, settled status will be with us. It will be something offered to European citizens living in the UK as a recognition of their presence. So no deal, settled status. A deal, settled status. I think even no Brexit, settled status. Because the Home Office have worked on it for two years. They've put a lot of effort into it. And we are one of the few countries who don't register Europeans living in their country. Every other country, with the exception of Sweden, you have to tell them you've been, you're there after three months. But we don't in the UK, so this is an, a way for us to kind of fall in line with other European states. So uh, we have a few leaflets that uh, you can find, particularly with our website on it, because that's where our links to the hub, as well as the hub, links to our information leaflets in own languages, but also in English, links to our booklets about how to survive Brexit, things you need to think about, and I would encourage you then to go on that website. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. So I will now call uh, Dr. Kiki Sonidu, uh, the, Dr. Kiyaki or Kiki uh, Sonidu, uh, the president-elect of the Hellenic Medical Society, and they're actually co-hosting the event as well. Thank you very much. Distinguished guest, we have the consul of the Greek Embassy here with us tonight. Thank you very much for attending, um, and other Precious friends, colleagues, thank you all for being here on a Friday evening. Um, I want to thank the New Europeans for asking me initially to, uh, if I would be interested in proposing to Hellenic Medical Society to participate in this event. Um, my name is Dr. Kiriaki Sonidu. I'm uh, a GP with special interest in cardiology. I'm 11 years in UK. I practice as doctor in NHS. Um, I'm the new president-elect of the Hellenic Medical Society and I'll take over when the actual president steps down in a few months and I will serve the society for two years. Um, I'm Goodwill Ambassador and Head of Health Diplomacy for the Hellenic Institute of Cultural Diplomacy in UK. We have the chairman with us here today. So we try to promote a lot about health and the rights of the doctors working in UK. The uh, Hellenic Medical Society is 30 years on. It's an amazing charity uh, society as well, which was created by renowned professors 30 years back, and they have served a lot and they have offered a lot uh, in the scientific community. 
um, it was great not only to know what obligations we have, but what rights we also have, because over 12,500 Greek doctors left the country the last decade, which is a huge number for our country, which is kind of small country. And according to the latest updates from GMC, we are 3,575 Greek doctors actually currently in UK serving mostly NHS. This is a quite significant number. The reason we wanted to do this event, and I thank Dr. Krakidis, who could not be with us today, he's overseas, who accepted to promote this not only to doctors, but to every European, Greek, and not only citizen, because it's not only, as I said, about doctors, it's about our rights and obligations and what is going to happen in a month's time. So thank you very much for having us with you today. We're not so much in politics as you are, and so active and capable, but uh, we serve this community, and we offer a lot as doctors, so we want our rights to be preserved. Thank you very much. So I guess now we're going to the main part of the evening. Uh, so I will uh, ask uh, Zahira Patel, who is an expert in immigration law and uh, an associate at the law firm uh, Fragomen, uh, to give us a presentation, which uh, will be followed by a and answer uh, session. So, up to you. Um, but while it changes, I also just want to stress that um, the, my key message that I want to get across today, and the reason that we do these, is because I was asked earlier, um, how can you be certain in an area where there is so much certainty at the moment, and every day, every evening, um, you will see more and more updates. So what I really want to do is to highlight what we already know. Now, there are a lot of things that we don't, but as has been mentioned, the, the key thing really is that everybody um, will have to register for status unless they already have some form of status in the UK. So I'll go over the exceptions, but by and large, all European nationals who are living here and you know people who are living here before Brexit date will be able to stay, but you will have to register. So that's really the key thing. And that's why the main bulk of this is focused very simply on the application process, but you will have a chance to ask questions about anything I didn't cover at the end. So what we're going to talk about, as I said, is mainly the EU settlement scheme. I've actually taken screenshots of all the application stages for your reference, because a lot of the questions I get given are very practical questions. You know, how can I apply? Which documents do I need to upload? How do I download the app? But I just want to stress I won't go through every single one of these slides. Um, it's, it's just there for your reference. And you will get a copy of the slides, I think, afterwards. So you will be able to, to see it and follow those steps. Um, and I'm already going to cover a few questions I get asked a lot. And we'll only spend a bit of time on the impact of no deal. And that's just really to reassure people. Um, because really, the key thing is, even if there is no deal, for people who are already here, your rights will still be protected. You will just need to apply for status. So that is really the main thing. So as I say, I'm not going to focus too much on the uncertainty, but I thought it's worth starting off with it because I know that's really what's on everybody's mind. So the situation that we find ourselves at the moment is the UK will leave the European Union on the 29th of March 2019 but we don't know exactly what kind of system is going to you know, be in place because it depends on a number of things. So you, you will have seen that the deal that has been agreed between us and the European Union um, was voted down, and we won't have another vote now until the 12th of March. So any number of these things could happen. We could have the current deal being agreed. Um, we could have a completely new deal. Um, Brexit could potentially be delayed, so a lot of people have been asking about this, but even if it is delayed by a few months or, or longer, the key thing is you will still need to apply for settled status or pre-settled status, and I'll talk about both of those. So there's no point delaying that application. So for your purposes, regardless of whether it's delayed or not, the key thing is you still need to make that application. And what I really want to stress is, it's true that a no-deal Brexit is, is possible, um, it will need to be approved by Parliament in order for that to happen. But even if there is a no-deal Brexit, the government has said that all European nationals who are living here by the 29th of March will still be able to remain in the UK. You will just have a shorter period of time to make your settled status application. 
and I will go over those deadlines. The deadlines that you need to apply by are in the slides, but the slides will be circulated and I'll talk about them so much today that hopefully that, you know, you'll, you'll know them anyway. Um, so yeah, all I've said here is this is the kind of uncertain situation we find ourselves in. But what this means for you is that at some point, free movement is going to end. And so you will need to apply for settled status or pre-settled status. And I've put here, um, it's the deadline that I've been talking about to apply is 31st of December 2020. That's if there's no deal. Now, if there is a deal, you will have a bit more time. You will have until June 2021. But what I've kind of been recommending is um, that you should try and apply by the 31st of December 2020 anyway, because that way you're protected whether there is a deal or whether there's no deal. So that is really the best way to protect yourself, um, given the uncertainty that we face. Um, and just to mention, because again, I do get asked about this quite a lot. Um, yeah, a second referendum with potentially no Brexit is possible, but I'm not going to talk about that at all, because that's not the situation that we're in currently. So I'm proceeding on the basis that we will have Brexit at some point and that you will need to register your, your status. So, as I said, I'll, I'll mention these um, timeframes over and over again, um, but this is just for you in the slides so that you have it and it, hopefully that it's clear. And the, these are really the key dates. So you'll see that on the 21st of January 2019, the EU settlement scheme has opened to the public test phase so as has been mentioned, it is still in a testing period, but everybody who's an EU national should be able to apply. So a lot of people have been asking, when can I apply? You could potentially apply right now if you're a European national or if you are the family member of a European national and you have a biometric residence card, you, you can all apply now. And I will we'll kind of go through how to do that. But you don't have to apply now. Um, as I say, we're scheduled to leave the European Union on the 29th of March. But between this 30th of March and 31st of December 2020 period, there has been a transition period proposed. Now, that might not be accepted in the end, but even if that's not accepted, so even if we find ourselves in no deal, at, during this period, you don't need to have applied for this status. Okay? You have at least until the 31st of December to apply. The key difference will be, if there is a deal, you will have until June 2021 to apply. If there's no deal, you will have to apply by the 31st of December 2020. And um, if there's no deal, you need to be living here in the UK by the 29th of March in order to make that application. So that's really the key distinction. If there is a deal, even uh, European nationals who enter the UK until the 31st of December 2020 can make an application. So hopefully that shouldn't be too much of a concern for everybody in this room or people who are already resident in the UK. But if you have, for example, family members who are worried about their rights, um, if there's a no deal Brexit, then um, you, they will need to be living here by the, 20, by the 29th of March 2019 if there's no deal. But they have until December to then make that application in 2020. Sorry, there you go. So, as I say, um, the main part of this is that you will need to apply at some point for your settled status. So, um, I just want to go through that and we'll go through who can apply, a few details about what kind of status you can get, and then there will be screenshots of the process, but we won't go through those in too much detail. So, if there is a deal, as I've already said, all European nationals um, who arrive in the UK by the 31st of December 2020, we'll be able to apply. So everybody who's here already will still be able to apply. Their family members who are in the UK as you know, family members of European nationals will be able to apply. Um, and at the moment, in the public test phase, um, European nationals' um, family members can apply, but they just need a biometric residence permit. Um, but eventually, hopefully, that should, um, once it goes to the kind of main scheme, which opens on the 30th of March, um, I, I think that that should be relaxed, but I'm not sure entirely yet. Now, I've, I've put here, if you already hold a permanent residence card, and I don't know if anyone in this room does, if you already have, it, it can take various forms, but it's, it's a permanent residence document. Um, even if you have that, you will still need to apply for, for settled status. Um, but it should be a simpler process. You shouldn't have to pay a fee. 
um, hopefully you shouldn't have to even prove your residence because the, the fact that you've got permanent residence proves it essentially. So you will need to convert the status, but it should be a relatively simple process to go, th go through. Um, if you hold indefinite leave to remain or British citizenship, you don't need to apply. So that's the distinction. Um, and I just, I know I've said it, but just to be clear, if, if you've only got permanent residence, so not British citizenship, you will still need to apply. Um, but th remember that the deadline is end of 2020 and a bit longer if there is a deal. So if you are one of, um, if you are somebody who's already got permanent residence and you will apply eventually for British citizenship and you will have your citizenship you know, in, in the UK before that deadline, then you don't need to apply, but you need to make sure by this date, December 2020, you either have British citizenship or you have settled status. So this is really the main difference. So as I say, a lot of people are worried about no deal. Um, but if there is no deal, then it's for people who are already here in the UK now, so before the 29th of March, essentially nothing changes. The scheme will be exactly the same as there would have been if there was a deal. So you will still need to make your application using the same scheme. You just need to do it by the 31st of December 2020. You do not have that extra six months in, you know, until June 2021. So as I say, I recommend that you apply by the 30th, 31st of December 2020 just to be on the safe side anyway. Um, the, the, the main difference will really be for people who are outside of the UK on that day and your family members. Okay? So for family members, existing close family members that you have they, they will need to apply, if there's no deal, by this date that's in red there, which is the 29th of March, 2022. And you must have already had that relationship with them by 29th of March, 2019. So for example, um, say I'm a European national and I'm already married as of today, um, and my non-European spouse um, wants to join me, that's fine because we're already married before Brexit date, but he must also if it's you know, a female spouse, they must apply by this date there, 29th of March, 2022. Now, if I'm not married today, and if I'm not married before Brexit, so if that relationship doesn't exist by 29th of March, 2019, they can still apply, but they need to apply by an earlier date. And the date that they need to apply for will be this one here, 31st of December, 2020. So if I already have a relationship with them, they can apply by the longer date, 29th of March 2022. If I don't have a relationship with them before Brexit date, they just need to apply sooner. They need to apply by 31st of December 2020. Um, and after, if there's no deal, after the 31st of December 2020, you know, they, they won't be able to apply any longer. But regardless whether there's a deal or no deal, from this date, 30th of March 2022, so that is still a long way in the future, but just so you know, there will be a whole new um, immigration system. And you know, after that date, so after March 2022, European nationals and non-European nationals will have the same system to bring family members over into the UK. So if you do have family members who want to join you, just bear that in mind. And um, because it's not the focus of this, I won't go into it in too much detail, but the main advantage of bringing your family members over now under this system is that the UK immigration system for bringing over a spouse or a family member, they're much more restrictive. They're much more document heavy. You have to prove an income requirement, for example. So that's why those dates are there and they're, they're in red. When you apply for status, what does that mean? Potentially, you could have two different kinds of status, either settled status or pre-settled status. Um, you will get settled status in the UK, which basically means you have the right to remain here permanently, subject to a few absence requirements, which I'll talk about. And you will get this status if you've been here for five years or longer. If you've been here for less than five years, you will get pre-settled status. Um, but, you, you know, after the whole point of having pre-settled status is that you can then clock up your five years. And once you've reached five years, you will then be able to convert that to settled status. Now, the main differences between them are, um, I'll just talk about the bit at the end, because those are the key differences between them. With, when, you have, when you get settled status, so say if I apply and I get settled status tomorrow, the main difference will be that I can then leave the UK for a period of up to five consecutive years. And that, that's really the, the kind of main difference. Um, and, I, and I can remain here indefinitely. So 
I, if I kind of leave for four years and come back, that doesn't affect my, my status in the UK. Um, that's, so some of you may have indefinite leave to remain or permanent residence, and that's a bit more generous than that. So if you already have permanent residence, for example, you, you can only leave for two years. Under the settled status scheme, you can leave for a period of up to five years. If you get pre-settled status, you just need to be a bit more careful with your absences until you reach the settled status threshold, because your absences can't exceed so it's six months in any 12-month period, and it's not consecutive. So I need to make sure in any year, for at least six months in that year, I am resident in the UK to both get you know, my pre-settled status and once I have it, to maintain it until I get settled status. But as I say, once you then get the settled status, you, the, the absence requirement is five years, so it becomes more generous. Um, and then again, I've just put the deadlines by which you need to apply, but hopefully those shouldn't be a surprise to anyone now because I keep saying them and I have already said them. So th those are the dates you need to apply by. 30th of June 2021 if there is a deal, 31st of December 2020 if there's no deal. Um, now this is the part I'm not going to go to, into in too much detail because I'm aware of the time, but I just wanted to put a list of all the steps there. It is much simpler than it looks. I just literally wanted to put every single step in there. But the basic idea is that you download an app on your mobile phone. At the moment, only Android mobile phones. We're expecting it to be released now to Apple um, devices sometime later this year. Um, and you use that app to confirm your, you know, your identity. Um, and then it links to an online application. It should be a very short online application, hopefully. So those of you who will have filled out, you know, 64-page documents, um, application forms, hopefully it will not look like that. It should all be done online. And really what I want to stress is that it will ask you for your um, national insurance number. And that's so it can link to your tax records, because that's the way that the government system tries to find out how long you've been in the UK. And that's to try and make the application process simpler and easier for you, because... At the moment, what the Home Office does is it asks you to confirm information that they already have, for example, in their tax records. And they're doing this to try and make your life easier, so they do a cross-check. But that doesn't mean you just have to accept only the data that they have, because I know a lot of people are worried about this. Um, if, if you enter in your national insurance number, or for example, you don't have one, and it can only find you in, the, in their system for, say, three years, rather than the five or six or ten years you've been here, you should then be given a chance to upload your own documents to prove that you've been living in the UK. So um, the, the, once you've done that, the system will tell you um, how long um, it can identify you for, and then you will upload kind of the documents if, if you think you've been here longer than the app says that you've been here, or the application form says that you've been here for. Um, the, the UK will then, um, the UK VI will then review all the extra information. They'll check your criminal convictions and records, so they'll do their own criminal check. Um, and what I want to stress is the Home Office has said that they want to grant your application. Okay, this is a very new way of working for the Home Office. That they have said they're actually looking to try to grant you this status. Um, but where the only kind of situation you can expect to be refused is if you have very serious criminal convictions. So that's why I wanted to make this point here, that they do kind of cross-check. And you will have to um, uh, kind of click through a declaration that asks about your, your criminal background and just kind of click through it. Um, but uh, barring that, they have said that they want to grant it to you. They want it to be a simple process. So if there's any issues, they will try to reach out to you to provide, you know, to, to ask for the further documents that they, they think are missing. So that's really the main thing. Um, and, you know, once they've then decided that application, they'll come back and tell you whether you've been awarded settled status or pre-settled status. So it's not that if they can't find you for five years, they'll reject your application. It's just that they will give you pre-settled status instead, which is um, where, as I say, you can then keep that status to clock up your five years and then convert it into settled status. And I've just put here at the end, um, and I won't, talk too much about it. If it's rejected, you, you may then have the right to appeal if there's a deal, um, or you'll at least have the right to ask the government to review the decision. Okay, these are, I'm not going to list every single one, but these are the documents that you will need at the moment. Um, and you will see that at the moment, non-EU nationals need um, a kind of original biometric residence card. Um, these are for your family members who are joining you. Um, I think that 
uh, and I don't want to kind of um, to, to labour this point, but what they've said is that once the scheme goes fully live in March, you might then be able to apply on the basis of a marriage certificate rather than the, the residence card. But that's something that you will need for the test phase. Um, and I've just put here that you may also need to provide proof of residence. So these are your P60s, bank statements, utility bills, and that's how you prove that you've been living here for longer than the system says that you've been living here for, if that does apply to you. So the next few slides, I'm just going to click through because this is kind of screenshots of the process. So we're literally just going to do a quick click through of it. Um, and I just want to point out here, though, that after the 30th of March, if you don't, if you don't have access to a phone that can, you can download the kind of um, checking system with, you should be able to go to an ID document scanner and they can kind of t help you with that process to check your identity. Um, some centres might already be doing it, but it changes so often that, that it's best to click on the link and see which ones are offering that. So this is how you use the app, and I'm just going to click through it. Actually, would you mind clicking through the, this part because the clicker is a bit frozen? Thank you. So you see this is, this is just what all the screens look like. So um, you'll see that in, for, in those slides there was a page that asks you to pay a fee. I think most of you um, that I've spoken to are already aware that you, at the moment you need to pay £65 um, for an application, half price for children, but that fee should be refunded after March. And if you apply after March, you won't need to pay a fee. Um, the, there is a section in there about how your dependents can apply with you and what documents they need to, to, to provide in order for them to join your application. So that's listed on the slides for you. But again, it, it's normally marriage certificate, birth certificate, kind of very basic documents evidencing your relationship. Um, and if anyone does have any specific questions about that process, just ask me at the end. Um, now, processing times, this is another thing a lot of people are concerned about, but the government has said it should take two to three weeks, which, as I think most of you will be aware, is, is very quick for the Home Office, and is especially very quick considering permanent residence applications, which used to take six months. So this is, again, what I want to stress, that it should not be like the permanent residence process. It sh it's supposed to be a much quicker process. Um, and it will be interesting to speak afterwards and see what your experiences are, um, if you have already applied. But from the people that I've spoken to and helped so far, actually most of my decisions are coming back in, in this time frame. And for people with very simple kind of um, backgrounds, so people who've been here 15 years, for example, and already have a tax record that they can easily pull up for five years, um, the, I've had a few come back to me in one or two days, which has n never happened before in any application I've ever made. So it is supposed to be very quick. Um, and what we are seeing is that if you have um, dependents joining you or if you need to kind of upload your own evidence, then it can take a bit longer. But even so, it is kind of coming back within that time frame. Um, and I've, I've just again said what you can do if, if it's refused for any reason, but I don't want to labour that point because so far I haven't um, heard of anyone I've spoken to whose application has been refused because the whole point is it's supposed to be very easy. But that's, that information is there in case you do, you do need it when you make your application. Sorry, would you mind just clicking to the next one? Um, so I'm just going to go over a few questions I get asked frequently before I open up to all of your guys' questions. So if we go to the next slide. I've already mentioned this, but this slide just summarises it because everyone wants to know how long they can remain outside of the UK. And I, want, I just want to stress that um, this will be something that you need to start thinking about because, um, you know, for, for, for European nationals, you, you kind of enter on your passport, you leave on your passport, you never worry about how long you're spending outside of the UK, inside the UK. That's really the part that will change. But hopefully for most people, the absences won't be too onerous. Um, as I say, to qualify for settled status, so when you're at the pre-settled status stage, um, you can leave the UK, but for no more than six months in any 12-month period. So you just have to make sure all of your absences don't add up to over six months. Um, but they will consider one single absence um, of less than 12 months. So if you have an absence between six months and 12 months one time, and it's for good reason, so something like you know, a sickness, overseas posting, childbirth, that sort of thing, they will accept that. And once you get settled status to maintain it, um, you, you can leave the UK consecutively even for five years, but no more than five consecutive years. 
Um, and right at the end, I just want to kind of identify the main cases that we get that are complex. And I won't go through these in detail because of the time, but it's just so you can identify if you fall within one of these categories. Um, and for those cases, um, it might not be as simple as, it, as I have been saying. Um, so you would probably need quite specific advice about these scenarios. And if I just go to the next one. Um, people also want to know about citizenship, and I just want to stress before I talk about it that the UK doesn't have any restriction on dual nationality, but obviously before you or your family members make an application for citizenship, just check that you are able to hold dual citizenship and that you, your kind of primary or previous nationality will not be revoked first. But if you do want to apply for citizenship, um, what's important is that if you are married to a British citizen, you can apply immediately for citizenship once you have either settled status or you have um, permanent residence. So there, are, there might be some people in this room who have permanent residence and who are already able to apply for citizenship if they want to, in which case you could potentially apply just for citizenship and not go through the settled status scheme. Um, if you're not married to a British national, then you can apply for citizenship um, if once you've been living in the UK for 12 months after being granted either permanent residence or settled status. It's, it's the same for both, it's 12 months. The reason that this is important though is I don't know how many of you will have applied for permanent residence already um, or who, if you might be thinking about applying for permanent residence. The main difference is when you apply for permanent residence and you've been here for longer than five years, so say I've been here for 10 years, I can tell the Home Office when I think I, I obtained my permanent residence right after five years. So if I've been here 10 years, I can say I obtained my permanent residence in the UK five years ago, and I've just maintained it since then. And the Home Office letter will tell you the date on which you've been granted it, so you can backdate it. And what that means is you can backdate it and then say, you know, I got this status five years ago, and that means I've now lived in the UK with that status for over 12 months and therefore I can apply straight away for citizenship. At the moment, for some reason, you can't do that with settled status. You can't backdate it. So you might have lived here for 20 years, but um, when, even, even, even though you have, you can't backdate the settled status. If it's granted today, you will need to then wait 12 months before you can apply for citizenship, unless you're married to a British national. So that's really the key consideration for a lot of people if, when deciding whether you want to make the permanent residence application now or whether you want to make a settled status, settled status application now. Um, and that's really based on if you want, think you want to apply for citizenship or not. Um, so that's the advantage of a permanent residence application. That, but the disadvantage is um, you know, it's a much longer form, it's much more document heavy. So everything I've just said about how quick and easy it is doesn't apply to a permanent residence application. But it does allow you to backdate your status. So that's, that's key for some people. Um, and just to point out, and it's not the focus of this, but if you do decide to apply for British citizenship, then stricter rules apply. And essentially, you'll have to follow the same rules that all other nationals um, have to um, kind of maintain when they apply for British citizenship. There is no equivalent, you know, simple, quick way only for European nationals at the moment to obtain citizenship. And um, I'm, I'm going to focus on this very, very briefly. Um, because it's what will happen if there is a no deal. And th this is, um, everyone in this room who I'm speaking to is hopefully aware that by this point that, you know, you, you've been living here before the 29th of March, so, you know, you, you should be able to remain as long as you make your status. But I get asked this question a lot about um, people's kind of family members or friends or people that they know, so I'm just going to cover it very briefly. Um, what we're expecting to happen is if, you're, if there's no deal and you're European national, you can come to the UK after 29th of March, and for three months, you can kind of stay in the UK without making any other kind of application. So kind of three months, it's, it's fine. If you want to stay here for longer than that, what we're expecting to happen is that you will need to make a application to remain for 36 months, so three years. Um, we don't know what that application is going to look like yet, whether it's going to be quick and simple, but we just know it will probably be an online application. So there will be some provision for those people to remain in the UK, but they will only be able to remain for a period of 36 months, and that's to take them up to the period on the 1st of January 2021, when a whole new immigration system will be introduced, and um, everyone's kind of rights for Europeans and non-Europeans will align, and whether they can stay or not will then depend on whatever that new immigration system is and if they meet those requirements. 
And um, so th this is just an impact on EU nationals, but I actually don't think I will stress this too much. Um, I just wanted to do the recap here, which is that if there's no deal and there's a U you're a European national and you're living here in the UK before the 30th of March, so by 29th of March 2019, you can apply under the EU settlement scheme. If you're relocating you know, after that date, but before the 31st of December, um, then if there's no deal, you can enter the UK, but you just need to make this other application that I've just been talking about. It's called, and it, it's called a leave to remain application, and you'll be able to stay for a period of 36 months, and then we'll see what happens with the new system. Um, but if you're European national, so for, for those of you who know other people who um, might be relocating after 1st of January 2021, that will be a completely new system. We don't know exactly what it will be, you know, what it will look like yet. There's some indication, but we don't know. So if you have a question about that, just ask me at the end. And we've already talked um, about your, your family members um, if there's a no-deal situation. So again, I just want to stress that if you do have any specific questions on that, you can ask. But again, there is provision for them to apply. They just need to make sure they apply by the dates. Um, this slide I've just put at the end because we get a lot of questions about which kind of family members can apply with you. Um, and so a lot of these won't be relevant to you, but I just want to stress that for family members, close family members who I've been talking about, um, spouse, civil partner, durable partner. The, so your durable partner is if you're not married to a partner, but you've been living together in a relationship for two years. Some provision if you've been living together for less than two years. For example, if you have a child, but mostly it's two years. Um, you, you, your dependent children and grandchildren can also join you, and that includes of your spouse as well, or civil partner, but not of your kind of cohabiting partner. Um, and parents and grandparents, dependent parents and grandparents are also included. Again, same if it's your spouse or civil partners, dependent parents or grandparents. Um, and I, I used to hear a lot of talk about this transition implementation period. I don't hear it as much anymore, but if you ever hear that, that's just that period that they're kind of proposing between 29th of March and 31st of December 2020, when the idea is everything is supposed to remain the same. And, um, you know, because you don't need to make your application until that date, even if there's no deal, the idea is that nothing too much should change um, during that period. You should be able to kind of enter, exit the UK in the same way. Um, and hopefully that, that should be without problems, though. You know, you never know, of course. So people who are applying for settled status, I think, feel much more reassured. But even if you don't apply about that, that point, it's not supposed to impact your right to then enter, you know, re-enter the UK as you as you wish during that period. Um, so that's everything I had to say. Hopefully that didn't go on for too long. But um, if you have any questions, now is the time. <laughs>